Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. I hope you can uh, hear me. I uh, So first of all, I would like to thank the University of Padova and uh, Professor Massimo Vidare for his kind uh, invitation and for the, uh, this conference held today uh, through the Zoom system of uh, Padova University. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, new recent development in the decipherment of linear elamite. And um, you will see that uh, we could do it. Before talking uh, precisely about uh, linear alamide writing, I would like to say a few uh, information before starting. There is a very frequent mistake which is made confusing language, the sound, what we are saying, what we are speaking, and writing system, which are what we are writing, the visual. A writing system can be used to record different languages. For example, it's the case of the Latin alphabet, which is used to record, for example, English, French, Italian, but also Turkish languages. Uh, here I give you uh, some example of a Latin alphabet used to record different languages. But a language can be written thanks to different writing system. It is the case, for example, of the Persian language, which can be recorded with, for example, the Arabic alphabet in Iran, the Cyrillic alphabet in Tajikistan, and also Persian language can be written also with Latin alphabet. Uh, that's uh, what we call Fingilish. So here you can see precisely that the same language, Persian language, is written thanks to different writing system. I wanted also to uh, warn you during this conference, I'm going to uh, quote very, to use very frequently the word Elamite language, but also I'm going to call it also sometimes Atamtite language. So don't be surprised about that. Whenever I'm talking about Atamtite language, this is what you know as Elamite language. Before talking of linear elamite uh, writing decipherment, let's see some famous decipherment of Near Eastern writing systems and understand how they proceeded. I would like here just to briefly introduce you or show you or remind you all Egyptian hieroglyphs were translated, deciphered, and all Near Eastern cuneiform was deciphered. So let's start first, first with the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, before, I just would like to say that each decipherment always proceeds in the same way, from the known to the unknown. We will see in each case, in each decipherment, if the language recorded with this writing system was previously known. Second, if proper names of kings, gods, places, recording with the, this writing system were previously known. And third, if for the decipherment if they had access to bilingual text. We will try to answer to these three questions each time. Here is, of course, you know him, Jean-François Jean Champollion. He wrote in 1822 the letter à Monsieur Dacier relative à l'alphabet des hiéroglyphes phonétiques, which is supposed to be the official decipherment of the Egyptian hieroglyph. And Champollion had uh, to work on the Egyptian hieroglyph. He had access to uh, bilingual text like the Rosetta, the Rosetta Stone. He had, which I think is more important than everything, still at the time of Champollion, the ancient language spoken by the uh, Egyptian, so in a more recent form, was still spoken at the time of Champollion, the Coptic language. So actually, it's thanks to Coptic language that he could make the decipherment. And also, he had access to the name of uh, previously uh, known uh, rulers, uh, they were known through the Greek and Latin sources. And for example, here you can see the reading Ptolemy and Cleopatra. Of course, these, the names of these rulers, they were known through the Greek and Latin sources. So in the case of the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyph writing, was the language previously known? Yes, through Coptic language. A uh, web proper names previously known, names of kings, gods, or places. Yes, uh, Champollion had access to name, names like Ptolemy, Cleopatra, or Rameses through the Greek and Latin sources. 
And were there any bilingual texts? So once again, yes, he had access to a bilingual text, Egyptian Greek, for example, like the Rosetta Stone. Okay, so now let's move forward and let's talk about the decipherment of cuneiform writing. And I would like to introduce you two very important scholars who worked on this topic in the 19th century, Grotfend on the left and Rawlinson on the right. So Grotfend uh, was uh, in, responsible for the decipherment, for the beginning of the decipherment of the old Persian language in cuneiform and Rawlinson uh, Com completed this decipherment for all Persian and he also led the decipherment of the Akkadian language written with cuneiform. Once again, be careful. Cuneiform is the name of the writing system and it could be used to record many different languages like all Persian, Akkadian and others. So in 1982, Grotfend, based on the work of Nibur, conjectured that based on the known inscription of much later rulers, the Pallavi inscription of the Sassanid kings, that the king's name is often followed by great king, king of kings, and the name of the king's father. The understanding of the structure of monumental inscriptions in old Persian, in, uh, for example, uh, Persepolis, was based on the work of Anctil du Perron, who had studied old Persian through the Zoroastrian Avesta, the Avestic language, and uh, Silvestre de Sassi, who had decrypted the monumental Pahlavi inscription of the Sassanid kings. This is uh, how, uh, what Grotefend did, actually, with the old Persian inscription. He could uh, he could uh, uh, determine what were the sign sequences recording the names of the kings and also the titles. And he could understand that here is written Xerxes, here is written the title Great King, here the title King of Kings, and the filiation Son of King Darius. So actually, that was the first step in the decipherment of, uh, of the old Persian language written with cuneiform. So in this case, we can see that thanks to linguistic knowledge in Avestan, Sanskrit, Pallavi, Middle Persian on one side and Greek and Hebrew, which recorded the name of the Achaemenid kings, Grotfen could determine the names, uh, or at least could determine the sign sequences recording the name of the kings in all Persian language. So was the language previously known Yes, more or less in a recent version, Middle Persian, and also uh, or through other related languages like Avestic and Vedic languages. Were proper names previously known, like name of kings, gods, and so on? Yes, the name of Darius, Xerxes, and so on, through the Greek and Latin sources, they were known. And were there any bilingual texts? So yes, actually, there were bilingual texts through the uh, trilingual inscription, the tri Achaemenid trilingual inscriptions. But at that time, they could not read yet the other uh, languages. So actually, uh, for Grotfend, there were no bilingual texts at that time. Rawlinson and other scholars, of course, I'm presenting in simplified uh, history of the decipherment, successfully completed the decipherment of old Persian cuneiform thanks to the inscription of Darius I at Bizotun. So here is the inscription of uh, Bizotun. As the Achaemenid inscriptions are trilingual, old Persian, Akkadian, and Elamite, this decipherment enabled to work on Akkadian and Elamite languages recorded with cuneiform writing, notably through the proper names. As Akkadian is a Semitic language, like Arabic and Hebrew, it was more, much more easily understood and read than Elamite language, which is an isolate. The Akkadian language recorded in cuneiform was officially recognized, I understood in 1857, through a very famous test less led by the Royal Asiatic Society on an inscription of Tiglat Peleser, a medio asian king. So <clears throat> we saw that Old Persian uh, written in cuneiform was read. Thanks to Old Persian cuneiform and thanks to uh, Semit the knowledge in Semitic languages like Hebrew and Arabic, Akkadian language written in cuneiform could be understood and read. So in this case, was the language previously known? Yes, in a way, with other Semitic languages still spoken today, such Arabic or Hebrew, for the case, in the case of the Akkadian language. 
Were proper names previously known? Name of kings, god, and places, yes. Once again, the names of Darius, Xerxes, and many other toponyms quoted by Darius through old Persian, Greek, and Latin sources. And were there any bilingual texts? Yes, the Achaemenid trilingual inscription, actually, thanks to the old Persian inscription. The Akkadian actually, uh, in a way, opened the cuneiform, the understanding of the Akkadian actually opened the cuneiform wall. The cuneiform writing system was used during more than 3,000 years, during which it was written to record many other languages, including notably the Isolates like Sumerian in Mesopotamia and Elamite or Hatamtite in Iran. We have consequently rather good but still limited knowledge of the Elamite or Hatamtite language through cuneiform inscriptions. So about the Elamite or Hatamtite language written with cuneiform writing, did we have a previous knowledge of this language? So as I told you, no, because this is an isolate. Do we have some information through proper names previously known? Yes, once again, uh, through the names of the Achaemenid rulers and many other toponyms and through uh, all Persian, Akkadian, Greek and Latin sources. And do, did they have bilingual texts? Yes, the Achaemenid trilingual inscriptions. So this is one, uh, just uh, to, to show you some examples. Uh, this is one of the most ancient texts recording the Elamite or Hatamtite language inscribed with the cuneiform writing. So here you can see that this language was written with cuneiform writing. This is the vessel, the Gunagi vessel of the Simashkan king, King Datu, around 2000 BC. We have nowadays two important tools in German for the knowledge of the Elamite or Hatamtite language. The first one was published in 1965. This is a corpus of the royal inscriptions written in Elamite language or Hatamte language with, uh, made by uh, König in 1965. And also since 1987, a very important dictionary uh, composed by Ince and Koch. So actually these are very two very important references whenever you are working on Elamite or Hatamte language. So, thanks to the Akkadian language written in cuneiform, we could understand Sumerian written in cuneiform, in, uh, uh, notably uh, through uh, a dictionary Akkadian Sumerian. And thanks to the Sumerian language written in cuneiform, we could decipher or at least start the decipherment of the proto cuneiform tablets, probably recording Sumerian language. And thanks to these proto cuneiform tablets, they were used in a way to try to understand more or in a better way the proto-Elamite writing, which here is labeled, as you can see, as proto-Iranian writing stage one. But this is not the topic of uh, our discussion today. Today, I want to talk about the decipherment of the linear Elamite writing, uh, and notably, as you can see, the, which was made based on the previous knowledge of the Hatamtite or Elamite language, which was based on our knowledge of the cuneiform writing system. So now uh, let's time, it's time to talk about linear Elamite writing. Uh, just, uh, I'm going to show you some maps just to understand where we are. Here we are around 3000 BC in red, is the area where proto cuneiform tablets were used in blue, where the proto elamite tablets were used. Around 900 BC, the proto elamite tablets they were not used anymore, and <clears throat> a few centuries just after, in the mid third millennium BC, cuneiform writing started to spread in Syria notably. Then, at the end of the third millennium BC, uh, you can see that. The cuneiform writing system was spread in all uh, Mesopotamia and Syria, and also with uh, it started to be used also in Susa with the, Acad the uh, Akkadian annexation of Susa, probably led by Sargon the Great. At that time, more or less around 2300-2200 BC, they uh, created the linear Alamite, or at least they started to use the linear Alamite system in southern Iran. This is in green on the map. 
And also at that time, they were using a uh, still undeciphered rating system uh, in the Indus Valley uh, called the Indus rating system in yellow on the map. And here, the white star just showed uh, the site of Kona Sandal where was found another rating system, which is uh, called geometric uh, rating system. And you can see at the beginning of the second millennium BC, cuneiform system kept on spreading everywhere in the Persian Gulf and also in the Anatoli Anatolian Plateau. We are going so to talk about this green area, the area where was used linear Lamite rating system. And up to now, it was, uh, we have something like uh, in 2020, we have 40 linear Lamite inscriptions. They come from Susa, 19 of them are from Susa. Kona Sandal, we have four inscriptions. Shadad, one. Marvdash, one inscription. And in Camp Firuz, in the area of Camp Firuz, we have something like eight inscriptions. So it means also that for seven of them, we don't have any information about their provenance. So here are some pictures uh, of uh, linear Lamite inscriptions. So first of all, um, monuments uh, of inscription of Puzo in Shushinak or Puzo Shushinak in Susa. We have also in Susa some clay uh, inscription like this, uh, this cone. And we have also inscriptions uh, written on silver vessels. I'm going to talk more about this inscription, these inscriptions. And also we have some very uh, brief and short inscription like one uh, free sign inscription on the um, Persian Gulf type seal. So this writing system was first discovered in Susa, Linear Lamite at the beginning of 20th century. It, uh, as I told you, it should be dated between the middle of the third millennium and the beginning of the second millennium BC. Uh, we can say we can recognize through the 40 inscriptions something like uh, two, uh, 250 signs. So here is a, a list of the signs recorded among all the 40 inscriptions. But this uh, signs list probably displays all the signed variants attested in the 40 texts. So uh, used over a large area. So there is something, there are something like 1,000 kilometers between Susa and Konasandal and a quite long period. It's uh, very clear that in the list I showed you, there are many variants of the same sign. And actually, uh, I could prove that, uh, for example, this sign, so these five signs are actually the same one. Based on the hypothetical number of variants due to geographical or chronological reasons, it's more than probable that the number uh, of linear Lamite sign was more or less around 80 or 100 signs. It is to be reminded that the pure syllabic systems without any logogram usually work with 50 to 120 signs. So I, I'm, I, I gave you here some examples of pure syllabic systems. A vertical stroke is sometimes used to separate words, proposition, or sentences. There, it seems that there, were, there was no numeral notation uh, in the 40 inscription known up to now. And the, this writing was generally meant to be read from the right to the left, left. So in some cases, it was written from the left to the right and from the top to the bottom. Up to now, this writing system was still mainly considered as undeciphered. Uh, there are two uh, main uh, contributions to the decipherment. So first of all, two papers of Walter Ince in the 60s, and of course, the very important work of the Italian scholar Merigi at the beginning of the 70s. These decipherment attempts, they were based on the big graphic inscription of Puzo and Shushinak in Susa, because several proper names they were recorded in the Akkadian text written in cuneiform, such as in Shushinak, Puzo Shushinak, Simpishuk, or Susa. We are going to talk about that. And these proper names, they were supposed to be also phonetically written in the linear Lamite text, whatever the recorded language might have been. So here is the case of uh, the inscription, we, uh, a stone slab, which was found in Susa at the beginning of the 20th century. It is right now, you can see it in the Louvre Museum. 
it displays a cuneiform Akkadian, so cuneiform language, Akkadian text. So here it is, and here you have the translation, and you can see that in this text, we have many proper names, like in Shushinak, the god in Shushinak, the name of the ruler, Puzon Shushinak, the name Susa, the name of the father of Puzon Shushinak, simply Shru. Okay. And there is also a linear Alamite inscription, which is labeled A. So uh, just, uh, I just would like to tell you, uh, we gave to the linear Alamite inscriptions the name of the alphab uh, Latin alphabet letters. So from A to Z, and actually we are talking now of A prime, B prime, because we, we, we have something like 40 inscriptions. So that's not uh, something uh, very complicated. That's just the name of the inscription. So this is A, the first and very important one. The first decipherment attempts, they were based on Inshushinak and Puzur Shushinak's name. Here, you can see uh, these sequences on the first and second lines. And actually, a German scholar could determine as soon as 1905, the signs used to record the sounds Shu, Shi, Na, and Ke, here in blue. And another German scholar identified in 1912 the signs noting down the sound in. And so he could ident identify the theonym, the name of the god in Shushinak. So that was a very nice beginning. In the 10th Susian linear Alamite inscription of Puzo Shushinak, there, is several, there were still uh, several important points which were unknown. We did not know what was the language used. Uh, the main hypotheses were, of course, Akkadian language, but also Elamite language. We did not know what was the person used by uh, Puzo Shushinak in his description to talk. Was he saying hi or was he saying he? On the basis of the proper names in Shushinak, Puzo Shushinak, Simpishruk, and Suza, this is what Ince proposed uh, as identification in 1969. So as you can see, according to me, it was very optimistic and very, very self-confident. Mary G was more careful a few years after. In, he only accepted these uh, identifications. And actually in 2012, this is what I uh, accepted as sure. And actually you can see that many signs on the, left, on the right columns, actually, I was not sure about them. So the first step, started with the name in Shushinak and the name of the ruler Puzo Shushinak. And you can see on the right what were the signs, uh, what, uh, which signs we could identify through the identification of these uh, two names. Okay, so uh, recently we got access to new inscriptions through notably the publication in 2004 of new inscribed vessels, uh, Ushang Mabubian, could uh, publish new inscription from his collection. So this is uh, the, the book published in 2004. And uh, I could uh, establish the complete inscription for uh, the collection of Fushan Mabubian in London. I published that two years ago in 2018. So that was the second step actually in the decipherment of linear Lamite. And here are some examples of the silver vessels in uh, Ushan Mabubian collection in London. Uh, be, a lot uh, when they were published in 2004, because their, their provenance was not known, many people actually were doubtful about them. They were thinking that they were fake. But anyway, I started to study them and I could get very good results uh, through their study. So just a few uh, pictures about this inscription. So inscription label X. As you can see, it's written from the, uh, three lines from the right to the left. Inscription Y, which uh, also display a very, very, very interesting uh, repoussé decoration. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's very interesting. And also inscription Z, which is one of the longest linear Alamite inscription currently known. You can see nine lines written from the right to the left, from the top to the bottom. So when I was considering all this uh, Gunagi, uh, yes, the name of this vessel, we call them the Gunagi vessel because that's the very typical shape for this silver vessel, Gunagi vessel. So when I was considering all these Gunayagi vessels in the Mabubian uh, collection, I could see that 
this inscription, they belong to a current corpus of text. And actually, this uh, Gunagi corpus displays command sign sequences arranged in a similar order. And so it seemed that they were giving more or less similar, similar messages. And they were very different from the inscription of Puzo Shushinak in Susa. And so very probably they have nothing uh, in common, uh, the Gunagi corpus and the inscription of uh, Puzo Shushinak in, uh, in Susa. And because of that, very probably the names Puzo Shushinak and in Shushinak, they were not recorded in the Gunagi corpus. Here on the bottom, you can see all the inscription written. Oh, I've, I, I know that it's quite small. You can see nothing, but it's written from the right to the left. And we are going to focus on the introduction on, of the vessels. Here are the beginning of some of the uh, Gunagi vessels inscriptions. You can see that many, some, uh, some of them, they start with the same introductory sign. OK. You can see that here. In red, we have probably a free sign sequence, uh, a free sign sequence, which probably record the title because this free sign sequence was also used in Puzo Shushinak just after the name of the ruler Puzo Shushinak. So that's very probably a title. And clearly, between the introductory sign, which is shown in green, and the title, which is shown in gray, very probably were recorded names and very probably royal names. One of them is this one. So I knew that the first sign had to be read she because it's used in the name in Shushinak. So I just want you to understand how I proceed for the decipherment. I was looking for a ruler who lived at the end of the third millennium, beginning of second millennium BC, because I knew that was the dating of the Gunagi vessels type. I was looking for a ruler who, uh, who had the name in four syllables because of the four signs. I was looking for a ruler who, uh, with a name starting with the syllable she because I could read it actually. And I was looking for a ruler with a name uh, where the third and fourth syllables would have been similar because as you can see, the third and fourth signs, they are the same. And actually, there was only one candidate for uh, corresponding to all, all these criteria, Shilrara. So I was very, very happy, of course, to find uh, this reading. And here you can see another name uh, written in four uh, signs. Actually, I could already read, I could uh, already read the third one, which is Re, because it's used in the, in the name Puzur, the last sign of Puzur. So I was looking for a ruler who was frequently associated to Shira because actually he was mentioned in this same inscription as Shira. Had, he, uh, he should also have a name in four syllables. And the third one should be read Re. So once again, there was only one candidate, Ebarat the second. So both of them, Ebarat and Shilrara, they both lived in the 20th, lived and ruled in the 20th century uh, BC. So something like uh, 4,000 years ago. So actually, this reading were the key, uh, which enabled to open the door. Another interesting reading was also an, in another part of the inscriptions here in red this five sign sequence. Actually, I could read, uh, be careful, it's written from the right to the left. I could read the first sign. It is the sign na, because it's used in the name of the god in Shushinak. I could read the third one also, re, once again, we already saw it. And here I could guess that was written the name of the god na pi re ri sha the god Napirisha, which is a very famous uh, god for the third and second millennium BC. And actually it gave uh, me access to three other signs, P, Ri, and Sha. So after the first step, here was the second step in the decipherment with the reading of Shilrara, Eberti, and Napirisha. Okay, that was the state of the art in 2018. But as you know, 2020 gave to all of us a lot of time to work. And actually this year, 
the complete decipherment was achieved this year. So in collaboration with Cambis Tabibzadeh, Mathieu Kieran, and Jean Pietro Bazello. Here is the paper which is going to be published uh, next year. So I strongly advise you to go and read it because I'm just going to give uh, a small insight of this paper because it's a very big uh, paper concerning all the decipherment. So I just can give you an insight of what we did. So what was the key? The key was that we found out that there were some inscription of the Simashkian kings and the Sukalma, so we are talking the early second millennium BC, recording very similar Elamite or Hatamtite language texts written either with linear Elamite or cuneiform writings. So the, the key was that we did not have bilingual texts, we did not have the same text recorded in different languages but we add bigraphic text. So the same or similar text recorded with different rating system, but in the same language. So here you can see on the left, the cuneiform inscription of Siwe Palarurpak in the 18th century. And actually many, many uh, uh, phrases, titles and uh, whatever, in a, a lot of stuff in this inscription, actually, they were very, very similar to all the uh, phrases, titles, verbs found in the Gunagi of the ruler Itatu the uh, first, which was written 200 years before. So once again, from the known, the cuneiform to the unknown, the linear Lamite writing. I'm just going to give, uh, uh, to, I'm just going as example, two inscriptions, two among the four inscriptions, because that would be too long. And that's not the point. It's just to give you uh, an insight of the decipherment. First of all, E, and the second one, Q. So this is inscription E. It uh, is an inscription of Puzo and Shushinak. So Puzo Shushinak lived in the 22nd century BC. He was a ruler of Susa. It was found in Susa in the early 20th century. And it is, as you can see, oh, sorry, I don't have any uh, better picture of this inscription, but anyway, it's very, uh, uh, it's a quite ugly inscription. It's not very uh, well written. And actually, many linear Lamite inscriptions of Puzon Shushinak, very surprisingly, they are very, not very well written. But anyway, and it's written on a stone slab, which is currently held in the Louvre Museum. And as you can see, it is a four line, uh, four lines inscription, and uh, from the top to the bottom, from the right to the left. Here is the same inscription, so it's uh, well written. And uh, it's more, it's clearer for you to understand the science. And I uh, wrote it for um, to be more convenient from the left to the right. So here is the uh, reading of this inscription. So first of all, here we have a very nice information because for all of you who knew before Puzu in Shushinak, before we were talking of Puzo in Shushinak, or even uh, Ince was talking about Kutik in Shushinak. Here, uh, so the problem was that in cuneiform inscription, the name of this ruler was recorded with uh, logograms. So we were not sure about the phonetic reading. Here, we are sure about the phonetic reading. And actually, the name of the ruler was not Puzo in Shushinak, but Puzo Shushinak. Second line. A title, Hatbak Shushen Ir, which means Hatbak of Susa. Hatbak is a new word. We did not know it before, probably a title. And it is uh, the title which corresponds to the title used by Puzo, in Shush Puzo Shushinak in his uh, cuneiform inscription, NC of Susa. So it means very probably scepter holder. The third line, another title, Shepk Hurt Hatam Tipir. So here, Urt means people, Hatamti, you know this word, and Pir, uh, Pe is the plural, and here it makes the relation between Hatamti and Urt. So it means the people of the Hatamtites. And Shepk is another word which was previously unknown, so prob probably a title once again, and it corresponds in the cuneiform inscription of Puzon Shushinak to the title Girnita or Shanak Shakanaku of the land of Elam. And the fourth line is the filiation with the name of the father 
of uh, Puzur Shushinak, Simpi Shu. So as you can see, a very simple inscription, just giving the name of the ruler is uh, two titles and his filiation. So as you can see, we can understand it completely and everything is read. So let's move to the second example, the Marv Dash Vessel, uh, so very famous uh, inscription, which is currently held in the uh, National Museum of Tehran. So uh, I think, but that's just an hypothesis based on comparison with other silver vessels found in the graveyard of Gunur Tepe in Turkmenistan, that very, very probably the silver vessel comes from Turkmenistan and let's say the Bactriano Margiano archaeological complex. We cannot be sure of that, of course, uh, but that's a possibility. It moved from Turkmenistan, let's say Central Asia, it was moved to uh, Fars, southwestern Iran, and it was probably inscribed in the 21st century BC. I'm not going to enter the details why I can date the day, uh, the inscription, but this you will find it in the paper, but uh, more or less the signs, they are uh, to be understood between Puzur Shushinak, so in the 22nd century, and the Gunagi Corpus in the 20th century. So between the 22 and the 20th century, there is the 21st century BC, which is, I think, is a dating for this inscription. So uh, some other uh, pictures of uh, the Marv Dash Vessel. So the inscription, it's, it is labeled Q, uh, is written from the right to the left on one line, but here just for a more, uh, it will be more convenient. I'm showing it here uh, from the left to the right. I really strongly emphasized the, uh, the, the, the stroke divider, okay? So here we start. Zana Marapsha Ir. So this means Zana, the lady, Marapsha here, of Marapsha. Marapsha is very probably a toponym, and I think that might be, well, that's not sure, we will need more proof, but that might be the local, the original designation of what we knew as Marashi. Well, anyway, here we have probably the sentence, a phrase, which means for the lady of Marapsha. Then we have a name. Shumar Ashu or Shumar Asu. Then we have a verbal notation. Laniina U Shari. Laniina means silver, U means I, the first person, and Shari is a verb with the H at the end, which is the verbal ending of the first person, and it means I fashion, I made. So for the lady of Marabsha, Shumar Asu, I made a silver vessel. And then we go to the second part of the inscription. Sian ish manirina, which means very probably in the temple. So Sian is the Elamite word for temple. Huh? In the temple Sian to be named for me, or we could understand also for the fame of my name. Then we have another name, Humshat. And then a second verbal notation. Giri nu tenatia. Giri means offering, gratitude. Nu means you. Tena means humbly, benevolently. And tia, it's a verb in the first person. Once again, it means I deposited. So it can be read like that. For the lady of Marapsha, Shumarasu, I made a silver vessel. And in the temple, Sian, to be named for me, me, Umshan, as an offering for you, humbly, benevolently, I deposited. So here, as you can see, it is perfectly well understood. We can read completely, understand completely what is written on this uh, vessel. So let's uh, see uh, how, we, uh, how we made this decipherment. So did we have access previously to the language? So. As I told you, yes, we had a previous knowledge of the Hatamtite or Helamite language through the cuneiform inscriptions. Did we know previously proper names like kings, gods, places? So once again, yes, through the Hatamtite or Helamite and Akkadian languages cuneiform inscription, because we have the name in Shushinak, Puzur Shushinak, Ebarti, Shilara, Napirisha, and so on. 
Did we have bilingual texts? So yes, we had Corpus of Puzo Shushinak, but honestly, uh, that did not really help. And what really helped why, were big graphic texts. I told you, what, the, what does it mean? It means that we have similar Hatam tight uh, or Elamite language inscriptions written both in linear Elamite and cuneiform writing system. So the same language, almost the same thing, but written in two different writing systems. Okay, and now what's next? So here you can see uh, the diagram I first uh, showed you at the beginning, and we could make the decipherment of linear Elamite writing. Here it's labeled Proto-Iranian writing stage three. We could make it through, sorry, uh, the through the uh, the knowledge in the uh, Atamite language uh, based on cuneiform writing. And the next step, I think, will be to uh, go from the uh, linear Lamite inscription to the Proto-Iranian writing stage one, which is the new label I propose for pro proto elamite writing. And so to go to the decipherment of the proto elamite writing. I'm not going to talk about that here. Uh, that will be the, the um, subject of another conference. But the point is Proto-Iranian writing stage one, proto elamite writing, and Proto-Iranian uh, proto writing stage three, what we knew before as linear Elamite writing, they are related writing system. And actually these are not two different writing system. This is the same, but at two different chronological stages. So uh, I will talk about that in another uh, conference uh, on the 14th of December, a new history of writing on the Iranian plateau. I hope you will listen also to this uh, conference. And I strongly advise you uh, to go and read uh, uh, the general decipherment paper, which is uh, going to be published uh, next year in Zaishri für Assyriologie. So here I, uh, I, um, I put for you the abstract. Uh, so we, you will find here the complete uh, decipherment of the 40 inscriptions. And actually, uh, this decipherment has many implications, so not just because of the decipherment, but it has many implications. One, uh, on Iranian history, because we are getting some historical information of the time of Puzur Shushinak and the late Simashkin, early Sukalma uh, period. Second point, we are changing completely. We are seeing in a new way the de development of writing in Iran and in the Near East in general. With uh, as I told you, new considerations on the genetic relation between proto elamite and linear elamite writing systems. And third, we got some new linguistic information on the elamite language, because up to now, elamite language was only recorded through cuneiform inscription, and now we can read it through linear elamite inscription. So we could make uh, some progress in the understanding of the uh, Elamite or Hatamite language. So here is my email. So I will be happy to be in touch uh, with you if you want to write uh, to me. Thanks for your attention. And uh, I would like also uh, to finish this uh, presentation. I would like to thank uh, people who really helped me since I started to work on this uh, topic. Actually, I'm working on that since 2006, since the discovery of the geometric tablet in, uh, in Giroft. And I really would like to thank here Serge Clouziou, my professor in uh, Paris University, Massimo Vidale, who supported me uh, since the beginning, uh, to Jean Perrault, and Hassan Fazeli Nashli. So to all of them, thanks a lot. So thanks a lot for paying attention to uh, what I said. And once again, I will be happy to answer your question uh, now. And you can get you can write me also on my email.